Chapter 1. The Forgotten Mountain And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Micah 4 verse 1 This is the forgotten mountain, but it will not be forgotten for long. When the ancient prophets first peered into eternity and gazed upon the all-encompassing mountain of divine love, they knew the time would come when this mountain would finally become the mountain that the nations would gladly find as their refuge and strength. These ancients understood that the last days would see this mountain rise to its rightful place among men, but they would have to wait for the right time that would signal the unfolding of all they saw. These faithful prophets wrote what they saw with trembling hands and their hearts bursting with the wonder of what this planet was destined to experience. Thus have their writings lived on and caused more than one mystic to search out what times or seasons eternity was indicating when these eternal words were written. But what would ultimately unfold would be far different than what mere mortal men would be able to comprehend. It would take a special people indeed to administrate such an awesome vision as the one these ancients saw. But it became the forgotten mountain. Man has marched confidently through time. He became master of the earth, master even of each other. People were reduced to objects for others to subdue, control and enslave. The years turned into decades, then centuries and longer. The mountain waited whilst man's corruption, his evil, grew with his pride. His territory and influence expanded with each unrighteous act. To be sure, humanity groaned under the weight of their oppression. Men bragged of their power. They scoffed at the warnings of lesser men. They had become invincible, or so they thought. For in their wickedness, they enlarged their own power through trading of even luxury on the face of the earth, including the bodies and souls of men. See Revelation 18 verse 13. Now, as it did many times before, the earth trembles under the weight of the decadence of prideful men. It buckles under the passions of those vying for influence, control, domination. Whether secular or religious, men have looked to their own wisdom, their intellectual prowess in their pursuit of the domination they crave. Yes, not many have seen what the ancients saw so long ago. Not many have embraced the possibilities of this mountain emerging onto the human scene. Nonetheless, the prophet's words are alive and as passionate as when they were first recorded by trembling hands and hearts. Once again, their words are causing awakening. Though man continues on his destructive path, oblivious to what is about to happen, the forgotten mountain is being rediscovered and embraced for what it truly is. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Revelation 21, verse 10 to 11. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, verse 9. Who is ready for the fulfillment of the words of these ancient holy men? Many leaders have judged themselves capable of bringing restoration and wholeness, harmony and peace to humanity. They make their plans, develop their lofty goals, and announce their marching orders, fully intending to subdue the nations, religions and cultures. All the while, the mountain of the house of the Lord lies ignored, judged unnecessary, out of touch in the shadows of man's self-proclaimed greatness. But the visions of the prophets, etched on parchment so long ago, are waiting for man to come to the end of himself, to come to the terrifying realization that there are no answers, no plans, no schemes that man will ever put forth to reverse the free fall of society in these last days. In their own strength, even their political, religious and moral strength, so eloquently spoken, the free fall to destruction is not being stopped.
Some are recognizing the failure of the very important plans of very important men attempting to do very important things for the good of all men. Some, after very careful analysis and evaluation, have the courage to admit that all that man attempted to conquer was never intended to be conquered, but rather the intention was for man to be lovingly gathered by the king of the mountain most have chosen to marginalize, to ignore. Some men are turning their gaze in desperation to the mountain once forgotten, although triumphantly detailed by the prophets who knew without question that this day would most certainly come. And it has come. Man is come to the precipice of emptiness, the brink of human disaster. Though others frantically work to rebuild the broken ideologies of mere mortals, shouting with more desperate words and hollow promises, There are some whose ears will no longer be tickled. Some will no longer respond to the empty words of hopeless and heartless men or be intimidated by the ruthless hatred of evil forces now unleashed on the earth. The forgotten mountain will not be forgotten for long. Honest men and women are turning their hearts, their hopes, their futures over to the one who alone dwells on this once forgotten peak. The mountain of the house of the Lord will become the chief of every mountain on earth, exactly as prophesied. But it will not rise to its rightful place because of religious frenzy or immovable orthodoxy. It cannot be legislated to the position of chief mountain or be forced to a place of authority by edict or proclamation. It cannot be voted into such a place, nor can men force it into place with violence or brute force. The external plans of man, no matter how enthusiastically stated, will never transform the heart of man. For it is in the heart of man himself that the mountain of the house of the Lord has laid dormant in anticipation for a time such as this. But desperate men and women everywhere are surrendering to the king so that his kingdom can be founded within the heart of man. The mountain has been obscured by the mist of human striving and the sweat of human assumption. It has been ignored over the millennia, its existence even denied. Man has been that certain of his supremacy, his dominance over the earth and all its inhabitants, even over each other. But in these last days, global and unchecked atrocities are surely uncovering the depths of human depravity exposing man's complete inability to govern himself. All this is in stark contrast to the majesty and wonder, the brightness and promise of the king who dwells on the mountain of the Lord. Some are beginning to notice. Some are no longer making excuses as our dire conditions are becoming visible to all who are willing to see. For the hope of the world is not in a new form of institutional governance, nor in a new world leader with new promises that can never be fulfilled, not in new religion or in the refinement of an old one. The hope of the world is the very real work of a very real king who is diligently focused, eternally determined, and has sacrificially showed us his way of true love. Why now? This mountain is the authority of redeemed humanity submitted to the king of this mountain and in the relationship of committed union, selfless transformation, eternal union. The mountain of the house of the Lord is within, waiting for those who die to themselves in order to see his expression through the likes of simple folks like you and me. The forgotten mountain is coming onto the stage of human governance and is beginning to emerge as the chief of all the mountains of authority and dominance. Having waited for man to discover his inner emptiness and bankruptcy, it is becoming visible by a most unpredictable phenomenon, genuine inner transformation. No longer will the nations be governed by those who have no inner governance to support the words they say. No longer will the people be so void of true discernment that they will not be able to hear the truth in spite of the spoken word. The hearts of men and women are the birthplace of the kingdom lifestyle in the earth. 
It is found among the most unlikely of all people. Kingdom reality is being born within the hearts of the broken turned mighty, the weak turned strong, the rejected turned powerful, the lame turned healers, the backward turned kings, the stutterers turned mighty men, the forgotten turned counsellors, fools turned wise, and the mighty turned humble. The Right Time Contemporary humanity is much like the children of ancient Israel coming to the banks of the Jordan after 40 years of wandering, failing, rebelling, deceiving, wallowing in unbelief and confusion. The old generation had finally died off, and for the first time they heard the confident words of an overcomer who saw the land of promise inhabited by enemies bigger and stronger than they. He saw the riches of the land and the risk of possessing it. Yet Joshua courageously announced that the Israelites were able to go up and take the country from the Jordan River to the sea. It was a breath of fresh air, a new hope, and a determined direction after so many years of being sidetracked and sidelined by their wobbling faith and feeble obedience. The time had come. They stood at the waters of their destiny. This is where their God wanted to take them some 40 years earlier. Now they were here. On the brink of destiny, they would have to decide whether they would finally respond to God or once again turn back into the wilderness where there was no hope, no direction, and certainly no destiny. So here we are as well. We have followed many very smart men, many charismatic leaders and dedicated holy men. We have new discoveries in science, inventions to make life easier, psychological and cultural advisors to tell us what is right and wrong. After all this, we are at the end of ourselves. We have been found wanting, waning and wandering. We are on the very brink of human disaster, where we will either ignore the reality around us and plow on to our own demise, or we will have the courage to face our failure, our uncertainty, our pride, and admit that we need a king who will have our best interests at heart. At this most critical point in our global history, the king stands at the door of humanity's heart, and he is knocking. Who will allow him unhindered entrance, access, and dominion? Where does the world turn? Governments are desperate. They organize commissions, committees, town hall meetings. Some governments sanction research studies, and others appoint czars. The results are predictably fruitless, for they are still convinced that human intellect alone can solve every problem. They call good, bad, and bad good. They blur the line between the sacred and the sinful. They deny God, but allow extreme zealots of every stripe to flourish, even religious zealots. There is barely a distinction between good and evil. All this in the hope that man can finally solve his own problems and ultimately live in harmony with one another. These vain attempts at humanistic governance and man-made policy only end in deterioration and wanton lawlessness. Society may deny it, but nature does not. Eventually nature prevails no matter how man denies its realities. Even our greatest scientific minds cannot alter the DNA of nature itself. The further culture disintegrates, the fewer and fewer rules there are that are acceptable. Of course, with the exception of the rules that keep the powers that are in control, in control. Many have short-sighted goals and have not thought through the consequences of shallow governance and policy. But these consequences are written in the very fabric of the cosmos and cannot be violated without tragic result. Religion? So is religion the answer? Those who claim experience, fellowship or communication with this otherworldly dimension are often deemed unfit at worst and untrustworthy at best by most who are entrenched in the currently accepted forms of governance. If the truth be known... The religionists are as incapable of governance as the secularists. No, religion has not proven to be any better. For history is also full of awful religious wars and attitudes. 
Their zealots have successfully alienated the world from the one whom they so completely misrepresent. Allowing their own fleshy zeal to consume them, they have destroyed nations on a grand scale and torn apart families on an individual scale. They have presented a most anti-Christ view of the genuine Christ of God, who in his eternal wisdom actually demonstrated that love by self-sacrifice, not by forcing others to sacrifice themselves, brings true peace. Yet even to this day, tyrannical voices continue to give air to the hatred and destruction that the king came to put an end to. These folks do not represent the reality of the loving God who gave his son for humanity's sake, that they might live a life of fulfillment, peace and rest. God has moved many times over the centuries and is evidenced by the number of monuments built as a result of his attempts to get the attention of mankind. Every time God begins to do something monumental, man builds a monument. A spiritual restoration begins and man constructs a monument to be admired instead of allowing true repentance to bring lasting change and the restoration the king intended. God moving within the heart is where the true transformation begins. When man claims the work of the king as his own invention for his own purposes, that work comes to an end. The worship of the event replaces the wonder of his presence. His formational power in the hearts and lives of man is thwarted. What makes this different? Throughout our history, most have governed, or at least attempted to govern, from the top down, the inside in. They have used everything from legislated policy to war and slavery in order to keep the folks in line. This outward governance ultimately fails. The heart of man is desperately evil. It cannot help but find its way to a place that it oppresses the land and the people. One can keep the evil within at bay for only a time. It will eventually show its ugly face in subjugation, guile, intimidation, control, and all the worst that the human heart can conjure. So what makes this different? The governance of the mountain of the house of the Lord rests in the heart of man. Here, the king does not control the actions of man. He woos them so that he can change their hearts. This inner governance is the king himself reigning within those who yield to him. Men act differently under the rulership of this king because they are different. The old, self-centered ways of humanity are replaced by the will of the king and his attributes. Man no longer rules from a methodology of governance. Rather, he rules from the heart, now transformed by the king. In short, the leader becomes what he teaches. He lives the life he wants his people to live. He becomes an example of the peaceful, loving, compassionate person his governance teaches. This lifestyle is one of broken repentance. That is, they have come to the conclusion that they will fail without his inner transforming power. They are aware of their shortcomings, their weaknesses, and their penchant to fail him. So they walk softly, circumspectly. They are attentive to the king and are ready to change anything that he requires. They know who they want to rule their hearts and live with an attitude of soft-heartedness and teachableness. They are taught by the king himself and in turn broadcast to all around them his message of peace and hope in the lives they live, not just in the words they say. But make no mistake, meekness is not weakness. These are mighty men and women who are ambassadors of the king, and they will inherit the earth. For the king of the forgotten mountain is now rising in the hearts of mere men. The king is becoming visible in this life, in our day, as the king of the mountain of the house of the Lord that the ancients wrote of so long ago and boldly spoke of as the day when the nations would stream to its light. That time has arrived. That day is now. The Sacrificial Covenant Enter the true kings and priests of the mountain of the house of the Lord, those who have made a covenant with the king by sacrifice. 
their own sacrifice. See Psalm 50 verse 5. But wait, I know, we have such preconceived notions of what this will look like that most run from even the thought of it, myself included. But for all our study, for all our books and philosophies, there is a very important spiritual principle that most have missed. Simply put, without a transformation within the heart of man, everything will always go on as it has. Fortunately, there are those who have set themselves apart to the king. They see their utterly bankrupt nature apart from their Lord. They have confessed the depth and the potential of the evil within and have surrendered themselves to the only one who can save them from themselves as well as give them the privilege of serving the nations, the king of the mountain of the Lord. They have made a sobering discovery about themselves. They understand life apart from this divine inner governance. They know who they are and what they are capable of apart from God, and it caused them to yield their lives, their futures, to Him. As a result, they have made the commitment to give themselves to Him for inner transformation, the kind of change that allows the very love and presence of God to flow through them. They have seen and have understood His power, for they have seen His love as well as His power at work within their own hearts. But I am ahead of myself. Allow me to start at the beginning. Fruit proof. Beyond the Christ-centered life. The function of kings and priests is as direct as it is simple. They allow the life of God to flow freely through them. They display in their own lives the possibilities of true peace, equality of all men, and the opportunity awaiting those who will also yield to him. The evidence of his reality in the life of an individual is what the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. There is no argument, this evidence of a king-yielded life should be easily seen by all. Equally, there is no acceptable time when this divine evidence should not be present. In the past, many have tried to be Christ-centered or king-centered meaning they tried to pattern their lives after the life of Christ. They determined what he would do and studied to understand his ways. But without death to self, true king-centered life is impossible. Man must die. He must humble himself, surrender himself to the king, empty himself of his own plans, pride and personal possibilities, for his fleshy ways are certainly opposed to God. Man must ultimately rise up to resist rule from any external force, whether that be from himself, secular or spiritual. But read on, the king does not wage wars, he establishes peace, harmony and opportunity for all men. Those who claim the inner governance of the king do not intimidate, condemn or create a nation of slaves in the guise of public safety or the greater good. That is nonsense. It denies the very heart of the king whose passion has always been to bring opportunity, peace and fulfillment to all mankind. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, for there he will teach us of his ways that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion, the dwelling place of the king, will go forth the governance of the king and his word will flow from the hearts of the meek and will heal the land. For the land that once mourned will flourish in the joy of the king. The people, once oppressed, will find their destiny within their own hearts, where the king establishes his kingdom and rules with a heart of love, compassion, mercy, and peace. There is no doubt that these words also will find their ultimate fulfillment. The only remaining question is this. Who will give themselves to the king so that these final prophetic words will come to pass? All they have ever said hinged upon the response of men to God, as man's free will is sacred territory before God. He will not infringe upon man's right to choose his own destiny. But these days are perilous. The hope of the world lies within the hearts of those who are of no reputation, little stature, and few endorsements. Those who will simply respond to the call of the king to die to themselves, to take the person of the king as the preeminent inner governmental force of their lives. There is certainly a new order. 
which is really an old order, born in the heart of the king and proclaimed by the ancient prophets who saw this day and saw the emergence of the king through those who would surrender to him. Rather than fear the future, the purposes of the king for this planet are about to unfold in ways that no one could have imagined. Consider the ancient words of the prophet Daniel concerning the stone which was cut without hands, which struck the image of the kingdoms of the earth and broke them to pieces. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2 verse 35. All the words of the ancients have come to pass to this point in time. They have seen the mountain as the hope of the world. They wrote it down. It is destined to be. Why not now? Why not through you?